recording going. There we go. Um, Michael Daly is a special correspondent with the Daily Beast. He was previously a columnist with the New York Daily News and a staff writer with New York Magazine. He, is a, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary in, 20, in 2002 and has received numerous awards. Welcome to the screen, Michael. Thank you. Um, I do want to give you a chance to read from your book just a little because uh, I do have numbers of, I do have a lot of questions about your process. So do you want to do that first? Yeah, I'm gonna read, uh, this is actually, the book begins as my wife suggested it should begin. She was exactly right. On my previous book, she made the suggestion about how to begin and she was right about that too, so. Um, just be sure to I'll, speak up if you don't mind. Oh, I'm not good at that. I'll try that. <clears throat> I'm a professional mumbler. Um, winter 1986. Registered nurse Nina Justiniano placed a stool beside the hospital bed where 28-year-old police officer Stephen McDonald lay paralyzed below the joining of his neck and head. He'd been shot three times by a 15-year-old suspected bicycle thief who had suddenly pulled a gun on an overcast summer afternoon in Central Park five months before. The last bullet had been fired directly into his face, nicking his right eye as he was sprawled on his back. Bullet fragments and bits of bone still impinged on his spine at C2, the second of the seven cervical vertebrae. That is the connection that a hangman seeks to break. Stephen remained unable to speak or even breathe on his own and the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of a Bennett 5200 ventilator filled his room on the 10th floor of Bellevue Hospital. The facility's chief doctor had decided that he would be better off dead. Stephen had been offering the same conclusion, repeatedly mouthing four words that Nina had lip read when she first began caring for him. I want to die. No, that's not happening today, Nina told him, because I don't make money off dead bodies. You die, and my check is cut off. Stephen had done something he would not have expected to do, even if he were able. He laughed. Today is not the day, Stephen, Nina had continued. You're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here with us. But Stephen had soon fallen back into hopelessness. Nina had feared she was going to lose him despite her best efforts. People die because they lose the will to live, she would later say. Stephen was at that crossroads. The whoosh, whoosh, whoosh was now joined by the sound of Nina pulling the privacy curtain closed after setting down the stool. She summoned Stephen's wife, Patty Ann McDonald, who was 23 and had gone from three to seven months pregnant since the shooting. Nina was 34 and figured from her own experience as an expectant mother that the baby's movements would have become pronounced enough for her plan to rescue Stephen from despair. Lift your blouse and put your belly to Stephen's face, Nina would remember telling him. Patty Ann got on the stool and leaned over. Her face appeared above Stephen, just as in the vision that had come to him moments after the shooting, when he was bleeding and losing consciousness, silently pleading to God not to let him die. Only her face was eclipsed by the swell of her tummy that was warm, totally soft against his cheek. And then, yes, he could feel it, all the more vivid in the absence of any other sensations. That's your baby, Nina told him. She even mouthed a reply, my baby. He kissed Patty Ann's tummy. Look what you do, Nina teased. That's it. That's wow. again. That's very powerful. Wow. How how did you how did you pick these particular subjects? Did you get to know the people? Did you was it just how did it draw you in? I knew Stephen. Um, he had a mutual friend who was a priest, Father Michael Judge. He was a fire chaplain. Oh yeah, and. Uh, he introduced me to Stephen, and um, <laughs> I knew the story. I mean, the whole city knew the story when he got shot, and they came to know him when he got shot, and then at the christening of his baby was born, his son was born, the baby that I talked about was born, when Stephen was still in the hospital, 
And after that moment when he felt the baby against his face, he was um, asking himself, you know, I'm telling himself I'm gonna be a father. What kind of father am I gonna be? And then he would think that he couldn't throw, play catch or run around or do any of the things he thought he would be able to do as a father. And that made him angry. But then he's filled with anger and decided I don't wanna be an angry father. And then he couldn't figure out what he was gonna be. And that was swishing around in his head. And then Nina's telling him, let go of that hate, Steve, and that'll poison you. And at the same time, Michael had taught him the prayer of St. Francis, which is to forgive, essentially a prayer of forgiveness. And that's going all around. And then when the christening is approaching, uh, he announces that he wants to forgive the kid who shot him. So at the christening, he mouthed a letter that Patty Ann wrote down that she then read aloud at the christening. And uh, he said that my badge is a badge of compassion and I forgive the young man who shot me uh, with the hope that he goes on and does something with his life. And that was not the most popular move in the history of the New York City Police Department, but it made a big impression on the people of the city. And actually when he was, um, transferred from the hospital to the airport to go off for uh, rehabilitation. Um, all the roads were lined with people wishing him luck and waving and crying. And, and then with the cops, the test kind of came when there was a young police officer who was shot and killed when he was sitting outside the witness to a drug case. At his funeral, Stephen, by then he learned to he was in a motorized wheelchair with a ventilator on the back and he learned how to steer it by blowing into straws. And uh, it took about two hours to get him into his dress uniform because he had to figure out how to raise and take the, you know. The final Michael, you may, need to, you may need to repeat that. Repeat that okay. because your, your internet stalled oh. about getting into the uniform. That all right, so it took forever to figure out how to get him into a dress uniform because you know you got to move his arms and move him forward and you got the ventilator and they finally figured it out. It took him a couple hours, so they got him in his dress uniform. He insisted he wanted to be in his dress uniform, and um, and there's a line because of the this young kid, the way he got murdered. There were maybe five thousand cops all lined up down the street, all in dress uniforms with white gloves, and he went down. Went down the line and um, someone started clapping and then someone else. And then all you heard was this, this kind of muffled clapping with these white gloves and like 5,000 cops were applauding him as he went down. And, uh, and he went on and he spent the rest of his life preaching forgiveness and um, saying that love is the answer. And um, he was on a ventilator for 30 years. He died. Five years ago, yesterday. Yesterday was the fifth anniversary of his death. Oh my! And um, and the church is talking about making him a saint. And they mm. told his family, "Don't throw anything out, because if you're going to get made a saint, you're not supposed to throw out anything." And the cardinal turned to his son, who's now a police lieutenant, and said, "Connor, you know this means you're a relic." So. <laughs> Is, is it a complicated process to become a saint these days? Oh, it's it takes a yeah, it is. <laughs> I think I think they'll make him actually. I think he'll be. Uh, he'll be well, a good I'm not Catholic, but I think there's miracles involved. And this guy is definitely. I mean, the um, there are a lot of things. Is like he used to say, there are no coincidences; they're only God incidences. Like he saw a meaning and. And whatever happened. And, uh, Tell me about the nurse. The nurse that's Nina Justiniano. Who is? She's what you call a piece of work. She um, she grew up in Harlem uh, in a tenement. There was a constant leak on the bathroom roof, so she used to have to go to the bathroom with an umbrella, and. Um, the father was a drunk, abusive drunk, who 
kept a half a $20 bill. And when he came home and he said, I didn't drink up all the money, I got this. And then he would always thought that was a big joke and he'd laugh. And when she was about 10, she started going to meetings for children of alcoholics. Um, and then around that time, she went to the African American Day Parade in Harlem and she saw these lines of these kind of very proud, erect women in immaculate white marching all down the middle of the street. And she said to herself, that's gonna be me. And they were from the Harlem School of Nursing. And she went to school and the guidance counselor told her, there's no way you're gonna ever be a nurse. But she kept studying and she passed the exam and she was about to become join the new class of the Harlem School of Nursing when there was a city fiscal crisis and they shut down the school. And then, so she applied to St. Vincent's Good Catholic Hospital Nursing School downtown. And they told her that she, her marks were great and everything, but they needed a picture. She had an idea what that was and she kept stalling and they kept saying, no, we need a picture. So she sent them a picture and a couple of days later, she got a call saying, we don't think you're capable of handling the curriculum. So she knew what that was. Um, then she applied to the Brooklyn Jewish School of Nursing and probably they never even imagined that a black person would apply there. <laughs> so they, they let her in without asking for a picture. And then all of a sudden she's there and um, it's a rough school. It's much tougher to get through than the police academy. I think only like a third of the students got through. Uh, you had to get 100% on the math exam or they wouldn't let you through. Wow. She, she got like a 99 and gave her one more chance. And then she was studying, studying, studying. And she was studying so hard, she fell asleep on the subway and went all the way to the end of the line. And the guy woke her up and she went speeding back and she got in and she made it. And she became a nurse. And she goes to a hospital in Rockaway, Queens, Peninsula Hospital. And one of the nurses there say, uh, well, you must have taken the colored test. And uh, she said, that's right. <laughs> they have a separate test for colored people. And I got it. Um, and then she, but she loved being a nurse. She just loved it. And um, she was really good at it. And if Stephen was, Stephen was shot by someone who personified the pathology of the Harlem, Nina represents kind of all the really great stuff of Harlem, the resilience, the determination, the wit, the fun. Uh, and um, so Stephen came, Stephen comes to the hospital and it's this big famous case, but everybody says he'd be better off dead and he's probably gonna die anyway. And, the hospital stopped even giving them medications because they figured it'd be better off if he just died. And none of the other nurses wanted to uh, take care of him because it was, who wants to be the nurse that was caring for this young, beautiful cop with a pregnant wife and when he dies. And as Nina says, the black nurses, we stepped up. So she and this other African-American nurse started caring for Stephen. And I don't think she he would have made it without her because he was, um, I mean, she'd tell him things like, you know, Stephen, you're the perfect friend. You know why? I can tell you all my secrets and you can't tell anybody because you can't freaking talk. <laughs> He'd start laughing. And it's really kind of amazing what she did for him. And, uh, and then she went on after Stephen. She went on to... Uh, well, the other thing is that when she was a little girl, she walked from the tenement, she walked past some of the brownstones in Harlem. And her big dream was someday I'm going to live in one of those brownstones. And when she started taking care of Steve and the city was in such bad shape that they auctioned off like several dozen brownstones in Harlem and anybody could put in a bid. And she put in a bid for like 28,000 and won. I mean, she asked Steven to do this and Steven said, go for it. <laughs> Same way he lip read, I want to die. He, she lip read him saying, go for it. So she got it. Um, wow. But it was a really bad neighborhood then. Oh, she asked Stephen, she said, Stephen, do you think the city's ever going to get better? 
I mean, is it worth doing this? I can't, my kids can't live there now, but you think I should do this? And she said, yeah, he said, yeah, do it. So he said, the city's going to get better. And um, so she got this brownstone and, uh, but she just never got the money together to, um, it was actually on uh, Astor Row. It's a famous row of Oh houses. yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, and it was on there, one of those. And actually, if you look in the New York Times, you look up Astor Row, there was an article in the 20s talking about colored tenants move on to Astor Row. And the article said that colored people, would, they hadn't moved in yet, but they were expected to move in and that would expect to cause all the white people to leave, which was true. And um, so anyway, so she had this brownstone and the, the sad thing is that she thought she's, you know, she was all set to move in and her and her grandson, Miles, who when he was about 15, he said he wanted to play basketball. And she said, you're not that tall and you're not that fast. Take up lacrosse, you'll get a scholarship with lacrosse. <laughs> so he became the only kid in Harlem who was playing lacrosse and he got a full scholarship to Bates College and he came. <gasps> captain of the Bates lacrosse team. So Miles, she and Miles and her daughter were all going to move into the brownstone. And meanwhile, they were all sleeping in a one bedroom apartment with the dog. And, uh, and the, but the, she started getting fines because she hadn't been able to fix up the place and it fell into disrepair. And um, the fines became so much she would never be able to cover the fines. And at the meantime, there were all these people who were calling her all the time, offering her huge fortunes for these brownstones, figuring they could get her to, you know, to pay her like half of what it's worth. And she ended up losing the place and the city ended up tearing it down. The landmarks people hated her, hated her. Um, so Astero looks like someone, it's like a, someone took someone's front tooth out or something. It's like, Astro looks like a hillbilly now. Mm. Um, but Nina still, you know, she went on and she actually, she, for a while, she, she was at, the, she's working at, a, she worked in the burn unit for a while, which is the toughest place in the city to work because you have to inflict pain on people to make them better. And then she was working at um, the ICU at New York Hospital. And this guy came in and said, I have a, doctor came and said, I have a patient who hates hospitals, but he's going to build his own ICU in his apartment. And you want to work there? And she said, sure. And then um, she gets this address. She arrives. She goes in and there's this building on Fifth Avenue. She goes in. The guy directs her to the elevator. She goes and the elevator opens directly into the apartment. And to her left is Picasso's boy with a horse painting. Oh my. And she's standing there and no one's there and she's walking around. And um, I mean, it's just. <laughs> Whose place was it? Yeah, I'm waiting here. I guess you'll know. The wife was Babe Paley. Oh. It was, so it was Bill Paley? Yeah. So the Bill Paley had a private ICU unit in his mansion? In his, not his mansion, in his apartment. It was a full floor, a full floor on Fifth Avenue. And, and did she work? She ended up working there? She worked there. And she, she walked in and um, one of his daughters said to her, well, you're lucky he's not awake because he doesn't really like black people. <gasps> And uh, she said, well, it's a good thing he's not awake. <laughs> That's the way Nina is. You tell her that, she goes, well, it's a good thing he's not awake, isn't it? They made her a fish sandwich. She said, I don't know where that fish came, what ocean that fish came out of it. That's the best fish I ever ate in my life. And um, she took care of him. And uh, there was a picture of a woman in a nurse's cap, which I didn't know until I did this book, that each nursing school has a unique cap. So you can mm -hmm. look at it nurse and you know what school she went to by the cap. Nina said, I don't recognize that cap. I mean, where that, who's that nurse? And the daughter said, oh no, that's my mother. My father likes nurses. So he had to dress up as a nurse. And there was a framed picture of Babe Paley in a nurse's outfit next to the bed. 
And her being black wasn't an issue that she knew that he didn't like black people. And did he ever, did she ever he feel wasn't conscious? She wasn't conscious when she went in. Oh, oh, oh. So that's he, why the daughter said it's a good thing he's not awake because he didn't like black people, even though Franklin Thomas was supposedly his big friend. But the daughter told her the daughter may have been trying to get rid the daughter may not have liked black people, but the. So he never regained consciousness. Oh, oh my. In conscious at all, Nina would have saved him. Did, did, did she remain? Did she continue her relationship with Stephen? Yes. Until he died? Not, not as close, not as close, but yes. I mean, they both had their lives, you know. And, 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 and she, when did she die? She's around. She's a so school she, nurse. So she, she, she kept in touch with him until he died. Yeah. She went to the funeral and the wake and, and. Uh, Tell me about Maple. Jack? Yeah. <laughs> My kids used to call him the guy who eats worms, but the um, <laughs> that's because Jack, uh, there's a friend we had, Matt, Jack was like my best friend. And um, we had a mutual, we had another, Jack had a very good friend named Maddie Stanish, who was a very smart police lieutenant. And, but um, he prided himself on never getting seasick. And he would kind of, that was, people have different things they take pride in, but everybody else would get seasick, not Maddie. He don't get sick. So we we're off Coney Island on really rough weather one time in Jack's boat, which was called the Quaalude. And uh, everybody, even Maddie was starting to get a little sick and you could tell that Maddie was like, so Jack said, hey, Maddie. And Jack looked and Jack took a handful of bait worms, threw them in his mouth and started chewing them with the mouth open. Uh -oh. <laughs> that was it. Oh. So Maddie's, Maddie uh, broke his record. <laughs> so that was Jack. Well, that would have made me seasick if I wasn't already. But he, he um, I don't know how you describe it. My you talk about how New York really changed under his watch. Um, he, well, he actually, one of the few true things Giuliani ever said uh, was that Jack Maple is the only person who ever single handedly transformed the major American city. I think it's true. I think that he, at a time when everybody said violent crime cannot be reduced, even when Giuliani came in, he got mad at people who said that you could reduce it, actually reduce it. Jack sat down on a, in a restaurant, Elaine's night spot, and he wrote on a napkin, we do these four things, we'll cut violent crime in half in two years. This is when everybody said it couldn't be done at all. And that's exactly what happened. What period of time is that, Michael? This is in, uh, what's that, 1994? Because I can remember going to Times Square when I was a kid, and it was just you just didn't go to Times Square ever by yourself, um, and it just transformed over a period of time. And now I really like it the way it is now, where you can walk all over it. Well, I used to walk through there with Jack when it was bad. He was kind of like the king of Times Square. Like when he went out, you could hear all the crooks going, "The Sarge is out, Sarge is out." The, um, that's when he was a sergeant, and. Uh, he used to say he'd be, we'd be walking around. He'd say, someday people are going to come back here. Families are going to come with their families, the people in night clothes. It's going to be Emerald City. Everybody go, yeah, Jack, sure it will. He said, no, he said, no, I'm telling you. And the, the, the Chandler building, I think the Lion King or something is playing now, was completely vacant. And we used to go up towards the top and there's a little balcony there and we sit there and have coffee and he would talk about how he was going to transform Times Square and the rest of the city and it was going to be easy. And You mentioned the four things. What were they? Uh, let's see if I can remember. I'm a little punched out today. Um, accurate and timely intelligence. Rapid deployment. Um, Wait, what's the first one? Accurate, timely intelligence, rapid deployment, 
I'm missing one of them. The last one is relentless follow-up. I know that one. Effective tactics. Accu All right. <laughs> wow. It is. Accurate, timely intelligence, right? Effective tactics, rapid deployment, and relentless follow-up. And when they, but basically what really transformed the city was when he, when he was a kid, he always wanted the big box of crayons. He had a thing about crayons because everybody else had the big box. He always had the little one. But the, um, when he was in the transit police, he had a robbery squad and he, he, he covered all four walls of this room with paper and he started recording all the crimes on the subway, where they were, when they were, he used color codes with the crayons. They called them, those are the charts of the future, he called them. Everybody thought that was more jack nuttiness. But when he became deputy police commissioner, what happened was that he reduced crime so much in the subway, he reduced wolf pack robberies in the subway from 1,200 a year to 12. <gasps> wow. And, well, and, um, that's and astonishing. Year, yeah, it was. Well, the reason was that the kids aren't dumb. Wolfpack robberies happen because they figured out that if like 12 of them surrounded some guy and robbed him, if the cops caught one, that would clear the case. They wouldn't go bother going after all the others. If that one or two unlucky people ended up in court, the victim would have to say, not only yeah, this guy was there, but he'd have to say exactly what this particular guy did. And all this guy knows is that he got hit by 50 different fists and feet and knocked down and it was a blur. So they never got convicted. So Jack started a thing where he went after, they would grab a couple. He was a genius at talking to them and getting them to talk. Um, usually talking to them about their girlfriends. Um, and then he would get all, everybody. And then he would have them all write confessions. And um, so when it went to court, the guys, he's got all of them, they're written confessions. Doesn't matter what the victim that says. And that's it. And then he started a decoy squad where they could end up grabbing them all. The decoy squad actually was, it came. Jack had his different uh, agendas all the time. And there was this police woman he really wanted to be with named Elizabeth. And he figured the only way that he was going to get her attention if he showed her what a great cop he was. So he got this decoy squad, but he said he would do it only if he could pick his own people. And they said, okay. And then he said, well, I have to peep pick people who look nothing like cops, right? Such as Elizabeth. <laughs> so Elizabeth ended up in the decoy squad and then they ended up getting married. And then uh, <laughs> they had a son who's now a detective in the warrant squad. And, um, and of course, Jack being Jack, they ended up getting divorced. Um, but it, the nice thing about his wife is that, I mean, his son, is that when the son became a cop, headquarters called me in a panic and said, what was Jack's shield number? What was Jack's shield number? I said, why? I said, well, Brendan, that's the son, put in for this shield number, but it doesn't match what we have for Jack's shield. And they couldn't figure out, they're all in a panic. So I called Brendan and he said, well, that's my mother's shield. So they assumed that Jack Maple's son would ask for his father's shield because oh, of wow. his father. And um, that really, you can imagine what that did for Brendan's mother, Elizabeth. Michael, does, does, he, does the son look like Jack? Exactly. You really? <laughs> looks like, I mean, it's so, when I went to the graduation, he's about the, he's about the same age as when Jack and I became close friends. And he's wearing a, uniform and a maple tag. I mean, not only that, Brendan just had a baby and before he had the baby, he sent me the sonogram 
The sonogram looks like Jack. <laughs> <laughs> look at that sonogram and go, that's Jack Maple. <laughs> Maybe he's been reincarnated. It is possible. Yeah. So tell me about how, go ahead, no, go ahead. I just gonna say, I knew when I was walking through the new Times Square with Brendan, and you know, there's one little area that's like a nature preserve. There's like two junkies and one pickpocket. And so we're walking, he's walking, Brendan's walking past there. And this guy comes up and goes, uh, this is right after Brendan became a cop and he's with his future bride. Guy goes, Coke, Coke, Coke. Brendan goes, Coke, yeah, what else you got? Guy goes, I got heroin. He goes, oh yeah, what else? We, what else you got? What else you got? He goes, I got meth. He goes, Brendan goes, look what I got. He pulls out his shield. <laughs> the guy almost expires. <laughs> but what Jack used to be able to do, Jack was so good at that, you'd walk down through Times Square with him and they would start, they would come up to Jack and like offer him drugs or gold or something. And Jack would just look at him and say, I'm not who you think I am. And then you could see it in their face. And he said, I am who you think I am now. <laughs> And they would go, good night, officer. <laughs> so Brendan's almost there. The, um, he's, a, he's a good kid. He's a good kid. But Jack was, uh, done, one of the things about Jack, which I didn't know until later in, in his life was that I guess I didn't know until we'd been friends like five, six years. His maternal grandmother, his mother, his maternal grandmother was a deaf mute in a time when there was a lot of prejudice against deaf mutes. And she ended up with an Italian guy who used to beat her and call her a dummy. And she actually met him at a dance hall because she couldn't hear anything, but she could feel the vibrations and she loved to dance. So she would dance to the vibrations and she was like kind of, extremely beautiful so this guy married not married her he took up with her had two kids with her one of whom was jack's mother um and he used to beat her and then the day came when she chanced into a guy she had met a fellow deaf mute she had met at deaf mute school was working as a typesetter at the brooklyn eagle because a lot of people in the printing presses were deaf because the sound didn't bother them so they ran off together. And Jack's mother taking along Jack's mother and Jack's aunt, her two daughters. And then jump ahead in time a number of years. One night, all of a sudden, Jack's grandmother, this is before Jack's birth, she's suddenly ill. And um, they take her to the hospital and the doctor says, this woman's been stabbed several days ago and she's got peritonitis and she's gonna die. And the detectives came and they can't speak to her and she's almost gone anyway, so she dies. And Jack assumed that the person that did it was his biological grandfather that the reason she didn't say anything because if she said anything then everybody would know that her two daughters were born out of wedlock and that the guy she married is not their father and god knows what the nuns would then say um and then not too long after she died the deaf mute guy she married was found with his head caved in in columbus circle and Jack was convinced that the Italian guy had murdered both of them. Um, oh, no. And when Jack was a little kid, Jack's mother and father had a fallen out from which they never returned when the father happened to find out that Jack's mother was not the son of... of who everybody thought was the father. The father was actually this other guy. And he, for some reason, sought out the other guy and then came back and told Jack's wife that I, I sought out this other guy and he's in the hospital. 
And Jack's mother, being a good Catholic girl, feels she has to go visit him at the hospital. Um, and she took along Jack and never told him it was a grandfather. And Jack thought, knew it was a hospital and knew there was something really off about this guy. And he later decided that it was a hospital for the criminally insane, but it turned out it wasn't. It was just, it was this horrible guy. And so anyway, so all that stayed with Jack. And um, when, the, when the grandfather, when the, when the mother, grandmother died, when his grandmother, the deaf, when she died, the Brooklyn Eagle by chance ran a whole page of crimes those two weeks. And they had little dots for each crime, numbered dots, and then a little thing about each crime. Number seven, I think, was Jack's grandmother. Um, I'm sure Jack at some point saw that, but anyway, when he started, when he became deputy police commissioner, he started something called Comstat, which every crime was recorded with a dot. And Jack theory was that you should treat every crime as if the victim were your grandmother, that every crime is important, that every crime should be investigated. And that principle kind of changed the whole city because for the first time, the cops treated black on black crime as seriously as they treated black on white crime no matter what neighborhood it was. So always, if you got robbed on Central Park South, the cops would often at least try to find someone who did it. If you got robbed on Junior Street in Brooklyn, tough luck. What Jack did is when he started this Comstat thing, he called in, let's say, the commanding officer for the precinct for Junior Street. He'd call him in and all the robberies on Junior Street would go up on the screen. Jack would say, what'd you do about the robbery on June, those robberies on Junior Street? And the cop being a cop, the commander being a cop lied and said, I'm gonna call the robbery squad. And then Jack said, oh yeah, who'd you talk to? Oh, busted. Ginty. <laughs> oh yeah, what day was that? Say, call the robbery squad and see if Ginty was working Tuesday. And the guy goes, you know, I, I might've talked to Garrity. But the next time he'd actually done something about the robberies and that changed the whole city. And so Comstat, everybody has thought of it as like, this is a way to, it became, people came to think of it as this is all about numbers and statistics and all that. It wasn't that at all. It was just a question of those dots and making sure everybody addressed those dots as if the victim were your grandmother. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. After Jack left, he was forced out, he and Bratton were forced out by Julianne. And after Jack died, people who didn't understand Comstat kept it going. They had to keep Comstat going or else crime would go through the roof. But they didn't understand the basic principle. So they started using it as a kind of a personnel management tool. So instead of just making sure crimes were addressed, they started measuring how many summonses cops made, how many stops, how many arrests. And it became, it led to stop and frisk. Back oh. It generated stop and frisk because they didn't understand. Jack always said there had to be fairness involved. And the other thing, the biggest argument Jack and Giuliani ever had was Giuliani would go, crime goes down, arrests go up. And Jack said, no, crime goes down, arrests go down. That's the way it's supposed to go. But if you're out there constantly just stopping people and frisking and, and stirring up everything, then arrests are going to go up. But meanwhile, crime murders did keep keep going down. Um, as a transit cop, the city cops used to treat him terribly. You know, condescending. They used to call him the Oak Police because if you met a girl in a bar and, you, and she said, "Oh, you a cop?" and he said, "Well, actually, I'm a transit cop," and they would go, "Oh," so they call him the Oak Police. And the um, <laughs> well, the Oak Police would. Uh, get treated terribly by the city police. Jack never forgot that. So when he was dying, he said to me, I'm gonna keep having those city cops for a hundred years because they're gonna have to keep doing Comstat because if they stop, crimes are gonna go through the roof. And um, 
crime did go keep going down because they kept using guns. It went to like less than 300 murders a year. So you went from almost 3,000 to less than 300, which meant you had 2,700 people walking around the city of New York who otherwise would have been dead. Um, wow, good heavens. In 10 years, that's 27,000 people. Well, it's really visionary that he came up with that. It is. It is. I mean, he... Um, he <laughs> I had to push him to take the lieutenant's test and he, he took it and he scored so high they thought he must have cheated. So they made him take it again and he scored higher, <laughs> which got them completely nuts. Um, he, was, he was just brilliant. He was just... He, um... talk, a, talk a little about your uh, writing process, Michael. Are you one of those people that binge writes the whole thing? And then sort of comes up for air, or are you do you write in pieces or certain time every day or outline or what do you do? How do you, how did you write writers. this book? I'm also I'm one of those writers who also has a day job. Well, yeah, th that does exist. Yes, <laughs> as the many of us generally have day jobs, and um, so you kind of grab what time you can which is time you really probably should have spent with your family. But the, um, uh, this book, I mean, I took a couple of times, I took time off. I took a couple of weeks off here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but I just grabbed whatever time I could to do it. And it, this was a little easier than it might have been because a lot of these are stories that I've kind of knew or told in the past. It's really kind of a collection of the uh, years of covering police in New York. Right. And then to write, kind of preserve some of my favorite people. Like there's this woman, she's Josephine Baker, the dancer from Paris. And one day I'm in, I'm with Jack and when I'm talking to the subway cop and she tells me that her aunt was Josephine Baker and that she grew up in a chateau in France and a million people went to her aunt's funeral. And I'm sitting there going, okay. Okay, and then it's for Tell Martin. I go, all right. So I, I happened to go buy Coliseum books. Remember them when they were? Sure. Right. So I go in there, and there happened to be just by coincidence a biography of Josephine Baker. I open it up, and there's a picture of from the kitchen of the chateau, and there's little Vertel in the kitchen. It's true. And, um, and she was, she was, she was a great cop. She was kind of Jack's sidekick when everything got going. And she used to, um, she's not what you'd call beautiful, but you could not convince her otherwise. And she would say that it must be something about this shade of blue. I put it on and they all turn into lovers. And um, <laughs> she, was just, she was the best. She's a great cop, great cop. <laughs> Well, Michael, did you do you um, did you keep like a lot of files? Did you like have a journal in which you wrote things about Maple that you relied on when you were writing the book, or is a lot of it just mining your memory? Uh, as bad a memory as I have, Jack's pretty memorable. So I mean, I had written a lot of things about him, um, and I'd written stuff about Rutel and other people, but with Jack, I just kind of it's all in your head. Yeah. I mean, I was there and I was there for a lot of it. I mean, I was there. I mean, I must have, when he had the de decoy squad, I must have been there for a couple hundred robberies anyway. I must have sat in on a couple hundred interrogations. Wow. Um, yeah, but your attention to details is remarkable. I, the, the, the things that you remember, I mean, even in telling your stories without even getting into the, uh, the nitty gritty of the writing of the book, just the things that you remember do go into quite a bit of detail. And so either your recall of these um, events is astonishing or uh, you do sort of journaled them along the way. Is that some of my work was kind of a journal in progress. I mean, columns. Uh, that's that's kind of what I'm driving at is just the bits and pieces that you then pulled together. Dick Babcock edited some of them. <laughs> That goes back a long ways, yeah, a long ways. <laughs> or Richard Babcock, excuse me. 
the um but did you have to do additional research on top of your own memory of events yeah. or I had, yeah i mean with with nina i had to i spent a lot of time with nina and uh, i didn't really know nina um until i started doing the book i really got started to get to know nina at stephen's wake mm. and um and after I talked to her a little bit at the wake, and then I talked to her a bunch of times after that. So, so you're writing this book and you, I mean, how do you, with, with all of the stories and the, the volume of information that you've gathered, how do you know where to stop? Um, I mean, how did you, how did you tie it all together? I mean, did you just say, hand it to an editor and go, what have I got here? No, no, it, 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 the funny thing is I, I always wanted to do a book just on Jack, but I couldn't sell it. And then I wanted to do a book on Stephen, uh, and I couldn't sell that. And then this editor, Sean Desmond, who's in the Irish Writers Group, or Readers oh. Group, Reading Group, um, very nice fellow. He suggested, what if you kind of gathered a bunch of cop stories together? And then I started thinking about how the city had transformed. And it seemed to me that it was kind of Jack Smarts and Stephen Spirit. And that those, that's the thesis of the book is that Jack Smarts and Stephen Spirit and the sacrifice and work of a lot of good cops transformed the city of New York. That's the theory of the book. So how did you get it published? Well, I, I knew this guy, Sean Desmond, from before. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember how I knew him from before. It's one of them, you know, Irish telegram things, I guess. I, mean, I don't know, you know. The, um, I, I always ask that question because everybody has a different, different way of getting their book into print. And it's often, I mean, like any industry, it is your friends introduce you to friends and then you find but you write for a living anyway. So your circle of people has to be, you know, based on words. I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard. I mean, it's, it's a little tougher now. It used to be you go for lunch and get a book contract. Right. <laughs> well, I know so established the, writers. I mean, congratulations on getting a published. I said this to Joya as well. Um, getting a book published nowadays is not at all what it used to be. I mean, just to sort of interject that uh, numbers of people have come to me that are A-listers and basically said, you know, they had to really, this time they had to struggle because if you know what life was like on my side of the book industry, where I could not get a copy of Make Way for Ducklings, the little kid's book for six months last year because of printing delays, paper shortages, cues mm. in the print line. Um, it, it's really pretty astonishing to say Rose Berenbaum, who is a very famous uh, chef, wrote a book that was to come out in October because all the cookbooks for the holiday season come out in October. Uh, her book was stuck on a boat somewhere. And so her pub date went from October of 2021 to October of 2022. And she oh. cried. So, you, you know, there's, there's just so many of those stories that every time I hear of a book being published and that people are reading, I'm thrilled. I am thrilled. Yeah. I think, you know, People ask you, how's the book doing? I mean, the answer really ought to be, it got printed. There's a lot to be said for that. And I really do think that word of mouth is huge. I know little independent bookstores really do. We talk it up all the time. You know, what are you reading? What's good? I mean, you know, there's, there's books coming out all the time that people have never heard of. If it hadn't been for a small independent bookstore going, this is awesome. Uh, <laughs> you don't really, nobody hears of it. Or a like few people every, do. Every once in a while, I'll get an email from somebody who read a book that I wrote that I, you figure is just forgotten. And then it's very nice. You'd be surprised. 
on it out there. It was it was really nice, Michael, to see that beautiful um, review in the Wall Street Journal. They really appreciated everything you did in the book, and uh, that was really great. And I wondered how much you paid them to write it. <laughs> and um, also, I to add really shameless. Twelve dollars. <laughs> what? How much? Twelve. Twelve dollars. <laughs> That's the Gorg price. <laughs> can't even get lunch for that anymore. <laughs> I had to pay extra because it's the first time the Wall Street Journal ever used the word love. So, what? The first the time? time the Wall Street Journal ever used the word love. Really? Hmm. So, so I wanted to ask you also, um, what's been the reaction from the police community on the one hand? And have you heard from any of the defund the police maniacs who are out there? That's a great question. I haven't heard from them, though I, the local bookstore, the community books, went down to see if they had authors events. And the person there said, uh, what's it about? I said, well, it's how the NYPD saved the city. And I got this eye roll. <laughs> That's uncalled for. I ended up writing an email to them saying that, you know, when I walk around the neighborhood, I happen to remember homicides. For instance, there was one directly across the street from you. There was one down on the next corner. There's one on the next block. There's one around the corner. There's two further down the block. And none of that, I mean, that's all gone now. That's all that they can't even imagine what was going on. Yeah, but that kind of reception, I mean, I, I don't carry self-published books, for instance, in my store, mostly because my store is so little. And so what I do with the self-published people is I let them, when I were having some kind of a fair in downtown Bethel where, you know, people are wandering the streets, I let them take a table outside and do kind of oh, do I, their own I, thing. I, I mean, nice. but that's the only way that I can really kind of put my money where my mouth is and, and support my community. Um, but to take somebody's effort and just be that dismissive with it is exceptionally rude. And you should never have to put up with that. Did, did they respond to your email in any way? No. No? Just didn't no. fell into I a bet they hole. didn't. Yeah. No. And it, but you know, I, I don't know. The, the opinion that I was most worried about was um, Stephen's family. Mm -hmm. um, I knew, I was pretty sure that Jack's family was going to be okay with it. But Stevens, you know, it's, it's funny. The thing about cops is you can write a thousand things positive about them. If you write one thing that's not completely positive, then they go, that freaking daily knocks us all the time. <laughs> the, uh, so, I mean, it, and it just emotionally, um, I didn't want to, upset Stephen's family. I mean, you can imagine what they, I think Stephen's wife and, and most particularly his son, who's this very intense, I mean, his whole life has been his father's in a wheelchair. And the, um, I was over there when he first became a cop and I'm there and then Stephen's in the wheelchair, Connor's going out, Connor's the son, he's going out to work. And there's Stephen in the wheelchair going, think safe, think tactics. <laughs> Connor goes, I will, Dad. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, you jump ahead to, uh, he was in during the riots following the, the demonstrations following the George Floyd thing. You know, he's standing there and there's, he's standing next to, I don't know if you read about the cop that bought boots for the homeless guy and it went viral and Times Square, he, he, with his own money, bought boots for this homeless guy, and that became a big thing. Kind of standing there. Now, this is a guy whose father forgave the kid who shot him at his christening and said, this is a badge of compassion. Kind of happens to be wearing the exact same badge. And he's standing there, and he's got the boots guy next to him, and there's all these kids, mainly from the suburbs, now living in apartments where people of color used to live until they got pushed out by the rents, calling them racist pigs. And um, it was very tough on Connor. Um, <laughs> the sergeant, Annie McGinnis was there. I think one of, one of the best lines I've heard in the whole 
recent days is that he said, you know what I noticed about these kids who were snor when they were snarling at me? I said, what? And he said, they all have really nice teeth. He said, they must have great orthodontry. He said, my kids' teeth are a mess, but these kids, I'm just, so they're, they're screaming racist, this and all that at them. And he's sitting there going, well, you got really nice teeth. <laughs> the, um, wow. But it was, Stephen's brother was, was, he took a particularly, he worshiped Stephen. Stephen was his whole life. And, and Stephen got shot. He's 15 years old, Tommy, and he goes running in and Stephen's lying there in the hospital. And, when don't die, don't die, Stephen, don't die. So Stephen, the only thing Stephen could move, he winked. <laughs> he winked at Thomas, and that was his way of saying, I'm not going to die. So, And Thomas went on and became a cop, and he had some very tough experiences. And when I was talking to him for the book, him I had talked to, because I hadn't talked to him. He, he's not big on reporters, and it was not easy to get him to talk to me, but after I did talk to him, he said, you better do this right. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And then um, after the book came out, I got a text that said, you did it right, like I told you to. <laughs> That's nice. That was, that was the best review I could have gotten. Have you heard from McDonald's widow? Patty Ann, yeah, she's fine. I mean, she, you know, she's, She's had some serious health problems recently, so. Um, uh, but I think she'll be okay. Um, she actually, before that, these problems, she got COVID when they can't, they canceled the St. Patrick's Day parade when the COVID was just first hitting. So they had one small contingent so you wouldn't break a perfect record of X hundred, whatever, how many years it was. So they gave her, the, the sergeant lent her a whistle to, uh, start the parade and she got COVID. And I got no, I have no doubt that she got COVID off that freaking whistle. Yeah. The, um, I don't know. Patty and I think it, it's just the whole thing's tough for her. I mean, to, to read of those times when, you know, Nina's telling you to put your belly against his face and then he can feel the baby and then, and you go through 30 years of, um, People, have, people think, you know, you get paralyzed and that's it. You just don't feel anything from the neck down. I mean, Stephen had, first of all, you, you can't have to wait until you're in constant agony. Where you're breaking up, you Michael. You can feel is where your head meets your neck. And so that's constant agony and you can't electronic, electrically. But at night, they would essentially, they would tie his arms down at night on either side of him. It looked a little bit like he was uh, crucified. And Patty Ann talked about sometimes she would stick his head in, it, stick her head in at night, and he's lying there with his arms tied down, with his head to the side, looking peaceful. So you go through your whole life of that. Hard to imagine. And the um, and as Connor said at the funeral, my father, the kid who shot him, was named Shavad Jones, Connor said at the funeral, my father had to forgive Shavad Jones every single day. So it isn't like I forgive you and then okay, everything, you know, you think about like a play yard thing where you say, I forgive you, okay, everything's good, you know. Every morning he still woke, woke up, paralyzed from the neck down, unable to breathe on his own. Right. In agony. Um, and, and the kid did not end up well, did he? Now the kid got out and got on the back of a motorcycle and the kid popped a wheelie and Shavad fell and broke his neck. Oh my. And, and actually, uh, Stephen took that really hard because he thought that they were gonna be able to go around together and preach forgiveness. And, and, uh, and Connor, who was in the third grade, it was in a good Catholic school, so every morning you announce your intentions. And he said, I would like for everybody to pray for the young man who shot my father, who died yesterday. Um, so kind of has that in him. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
but that's 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 a large load for a kid to carry is sort of keep i mean to to carry on when your father's been paralyzed and and try and uh maintain and become the standard bearer for the family i mean that's that's a lot no it is and it's and you know he, he said to me once um i wish i had a sibling because he has nobody to share the experience with it's just that's him and uh, and the, the, they couldn't have another kid um so he's it's thank god he married a very nice woman she's like really warm and like steel at the same time she's like worn steel like she doesn't you know she's just she's really good and um he's funny you know Stephen loved to dance his favorite thing in the world was dancing that killed me i was at a party once i think Rona was at the party too. We used to go to this Christmas party where Stephen would be, and everybody was dancing. And then I'm standing there with Stephen's wife, and we're watching the dancing. And she just turned to me and she said, "You know, Stephen loved to dance, and, uh, and he did. And he was, you know, Nina taught taught him how to move his head, got him moving his head. You know, and said, you know, white boy, you got the rhythm off. You know, you got to get to the beat. <laughs> you got it going. The hours in the room." You know, popping to the, he could only move his head about a half an inch, but she got him doing that. And one of my great images of him was that the, on his last Christmas, his sister threw a big party. She got a heated tent on the back deck where the whole family was there. And um, they were, Stephen's favorite music was the Quadraphonic, the Who, the album. He just loved that. And they were blasting that. And then the heater gave out and everybody was freezing, but Stephen wasn't ready to leave. So they threw blankets on him. <laughs> this big pile of blankets with these just eyes sticking out and his head just still moving to the music. That was Stephen. Your intention in writing the book is for us to know these people? Yeah, the... Um... It's really more of a it's it's, know it's them, a broader also, question, but yeah. you no, know, but I mean to know them and to know what they did and what they've done and the value of what they've done and the value of who they were. And they're both dead. Um, I was there when Jack died. Um, actually, his wife said his, his wife, his second wife, is a police lieutenant. And she said, I don't want to call anybody. So we, she cranked up the air conditioning. And we sat there for about six hours. And then finally she said, do you think we're going to get in trouble? I said, Bridget, I don't know. <laughs> You're the police lieutenant. But you can imagine what happened when you call up and say, former deputy commissioner Jack Maple's dead. I mean, the whole police department went nuts. And then Stephen, when he was dying, uh, Connor had groups of people come in and all join hands and pray together and all the cops who would work for Stephen as drivers and with him and loved him and everything they put their shields on his chest and um it was a, it was amazing you know and Connor and Patty Ann and Connor with Patty and Stephen's wife they were they just brought in all these groups of people to all be with Stephen in his final moments and, uh, and included there was a there's two cops who were assassinated in uh, December of 2014 one of them was this was named Lou his wife was Sandy and then when, when he was shot she's at the emergency room after he they both got shot in the head and they're not gonna, they're gone and uh, she asked one of the doctors is there a way to get some of the semen because we wanted to have a child we were going to have a child they've only been married a couple of months they wanted to have a child and so the ambulance on the way from the hospital to the morgue made a stop at a place where a doctor did what he had to do and they kept it frozen you have to wait like a year or something there's a period of time you got to wait so they can make sure that it's not just a 
acting out of grief is something you really want to do and was something she really wanted to do. And they told her she was pregnant and they told her that, you know, you don't want to, don't do anything, don't go anywhere. But she heard Stephen was dying. So she came pregnant with uh, the unborn child of this dead cop. And um, she joined the prayers. Um, and then, you know, three months later, four months later, she had the baby. So the baby looks just like the father. Oh, that's great. Yep. Uh, so that's right. I would just to tell those stories, preserve those stories. And, you know, that's it. That's what I've done with my life. That's the better part of what I've done with my life. They're, they're really meaningful stories and they're people of substance and people that have contributed a lot, but they're also capable of inspiring other people. And that's, that's one of the things that I really love is that, is that the stories are, you know, when you talk about two people and one person encouraging somebody else to live, somebody needs to hear that story. So I would these are, everybody would hear Nina, Nina and Steven's story. <laughs> to me is but but in this in this day and age to have to have struggle is something that people really do want to read about and they really do want to learn about but they also want to see that that goes somewhere i mean what i'm seeing people wanting to read and wanting to have they don't mind that it's difficult or that it's hard to uh, to, to hear some of these stories, but they do want to hear it move forward. And that's what I think one of the things that you can offer people with this book is the fact that there were full and rich lives despite uh, it being so difficult. Yeah, I say Stephen in particular. I mean, um... Well, and, and... And Jack, yeah. too. I mean, if you think, you know, Jack... When he was 23, a guy, he tried to arrest a guy and a guy grabbed his gun and the guy had the gun, Jack had his hand around the cylinder thinking it would stop the gun from firing and the guy was stronger than him and got the gun right in his face. And Jack could feel the cylinder start to turn so he knew he was gonna get shot and he moved it the last second and the muzzle flash burned Jack's cheek and then it swung back right into his face and then it started moving again. So he pushed it the other way and he got a muzzle flash burn on the other cheek. And, and then he rolled over and he managed to get the gun between them and he managed to get his finger on the trigger, but the, he could feel the guy getting the gun back and he knew the guy was stronger. He knew the guy was going to have the gun in a moment. So he just started pulling the trigger, not knowing which way the muzzle was pointed. He didn't know who was going to get shot. And the other guy got shot. And uh, so Jack worked at Columbus Circle, but he had to catch the train to Queens. So he had to walk along Central Park South, where he later lived. Um, and he had a muzzle flash burn on each cheek, and he was covered with blood, and he was going home. And um, walked past the oak bar and he looks through those plate glass windows and it looked to him like nothing bad could ever happen there. <laughs> like, that is, you know, nothing bad could ever happen there. So jump ahead in time, he became the youngest detective on the transit police and Jack being Jack, he was all dressed up and he's walking up to the plaza on his way to where he worked. And he slowed and the doorman said, good evening, sir. And Jack realized that he was speaking to Jack as if he could go in there. <laughs> I mean, I think generally cops, they have, transit cops have had this feeling that like alarms go off if someone like them goes into the plaza. You know, it's like the, um, Jack walked in and nobody seemed to think he didn't belong there. And uh, he got his first indication that it was a different culture when he threw money up on the bar and the guy just kind of slid it back to him. Like, what, what are you doing? And he uh, ordered a Chablis. 
and he realized if the price of a movie he could stand there as long as he wanted making chit chat with people and like that's you know that was jack did he have the hamburg in those days he did yeah he did and a bow tie he said i always liked the look <laughs> He only wore a straight tie one day a year, and all this. And when he did, all the bosses at police headquarters would go, "Oh, Maple, you're dressing normal." He would say, "It's Halloween." <laughs> that was his costume: a straight tie on Halloween. That was his costume. So, I mean, and you know, he was dying, dying. He said, "He said, you know, I'm really gonna miss this place." I said, "What place, Jack?" He said, "Earth." <laughs> he just he had his own, you know. And he had a kind of transit cops in particular have a very direct way of looking at things. Like the only time I ever went to a movie with him, we were at Silence of the Lambs. You know that thing where they bring that guy out and he's got the mask on so he doesn't bite anybody? But Jack says in a loud voice, why don't they just knock his freaking teeth out? <laughs> like other people around are going, you know, why don't they just knock his freaking teeth out? And I think it ruined the movie for half the people there because they couldn't figure out why they didn't just knock his teeth out. And that was Jack. So I, know, I miss them both terribly. I can tell because your stories are really, you know, they're very, uh, very personal and they're very you know you you seem to be a little wistful about it and it's does it make it easier for you or more difficult to talk about i mean do you just get sad after you've talked about your book or are you just really glad to be able to tell the story some more no, I, i'm sad because they're gone but i i i feel glad that i preserved some of it in some fashion i mean um I mean, you know, if someone didn't know anything about Stephen McDonald, started reading about him, then they might, you know. I've tried to write through the book in a way that anybody who read it would end up knowing both of them. And also kind of knowing the city and knowing some of the cops that when you hear all the horrible things other cops do and the bad things other cops do and the there's also these other people. Um, and some of them, uh, and one thing I always remember is that there was a, this Stephen Mc, uh, not Stephen, there was another McDonald kid who was killed and um, his wife, Sean McDonald, his name was. And his wife is, they had two kids, two little kids at home and I guess a relative was watching them and the wife was working as a waitress to make a little more money off a cop's salary. And she gets notified that her husband's been shot. And they flew her by helicopter to uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And there's like a long, long hallway um, leading to the emergency room. And when a cop gets shot, every cop in the world comes and so there's a million cops there, a million people. And then all of a sudden it goes absolutely silent because the widow's arrived and she's walking down this hallway and you can hear this jingling. And then someone near me said, oh my God, those are her tips. She was still wearing the waitress outfit. Oh. She'd literally been working for coins while her husband was getting shot in the head in the Bronx. And then she is, is absolutely silent except for the coins. And then you hear this scream, like, unlike any scream I ever heard in my life. Um, she spent some time with him and she had grabbed him and he was shot in the head. So she got blood all over him and she wiped her hands on, she's wearing a white jacket. 
And she came out and she said, I'm never changing this jacket ever. And she left. So, you know, I don't know. It's, just, it's worth recording that, I guess. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, Michael, this has been an amazing journey this evening, hearing these stories and getting to know these people and, and how much you cared for them clearly and the relationship that they had. Um, I'm hoping a lot of people get a chance to read your book. Well, I hope um, someone. <laughs> well, no, it's, you know, it's, I like it's I as I it's said, a... it's really important to get published. I mean, yeah. it, you, you obviously have gotten it out there. You've had an editor, you've gone through a professional process and it, it is meaningful if, from that standpoint. And clearly other people felt really moved by your book enough to, 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 to say yes and publish it. So bravo yeah. for that. Um, it was faith on their part, so, you know. Well, good. Um, is there one final thing you want us to know that we might not have discussed tonight? Because um, we've talked about a lot, but I know that there's always one. Well, in the acknowledgments, I, I dedicated the book to my wife, um, who saved me in many ways, and literally saved me once when a guy was trying to stab me on Flappers Avenue. And she kept jumping in front of him. He got mad because he wanted to kill me and she kept getting in the way. But the I was thinking, well, you do the dedication, but then you don't put the person to the dedication and the acknowledgments. And the first person I should have put in the acknowledgement was her. And among the many reasons was that the uh, she's the one who suggested the way to start the book. And I think that was exactly the right way to start the book. And it was it was kind of just mechanically it was a tough book because you have two people and a million different stories and they're related but they're not and it's kind of all these anecdotes and how do you kind of set a tone for it and carry it through and my wife is exactly right so I think if I could reprint the book the, first, <laughs> the only thing I want to change is the acknowledgments and I would note that I saw to my shame that, that Joya did exactly the right thing by Dick in her acknowledgments, so. Um, anyway. Well, that, that cost me quite a bit of money, Michael. That, there's, there's a transaction involved there. Is that $14? Is that <laughs> yeah, <it was>? exactly. <laughs> anyway, thank you for having me. It's very nice of you. It's um, been wonderful. It's been a wonderful evening. And it was great to get to know you. I really I do some. appreciate the time and the, and the, uh, the, the effort. the uh, plague lifts? I'll see you up there. That it's a deal, absolutely. I Stay noticed in, on the train that the train. Are we frozen train, here? train stops right in Basel. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so so absolutely come up. Thank you all for joining in tonight and the questions that you asked. They really enrich the evening. So, Michael, we'll talk soon. I hope so. Wonderful Thank book. It's yes. a wonderful book, Michael. Oh, and by the way, Richard Babcock came and rescued me at the end with. Uh, Giving it a read and, and an edit. Well, it, it is. It, it long before I was there. It was a wonderful, wonderful book. Best editor I've ever had. Congratulations! I, I think it feels Congratulations the same. on the publishing of your book. Thank you. All right. Take care. God bless. Bye bye. God bless. Bye bye. bye, -bye.